Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank the organizers for getting me here in three feet of snow, uh, <clears throat> which is quite a change from Pennsylvania. We just got into our 70s. Um, so what I'm going to talk today is about um, intelligent motors and pumps. Uh, we call them bots because that sounds sexier. Uh, <clears throat> and those of you who are old enough to remember this, this is from the uh, movie Fantastic Voyage where you had these guys who are shrunk in size and put in this uh, vehicle and it's going through the uh, arteries and veins. Uh, these are the red blood cells and they repair uh, things in your body and, and that's sort of our inspiration. So what we are trying to do is to design synthetic active matter uh, that will exhibit emergent properties and that requires two things. You need information and you need something that can respond to this information. And so here you see uh, silver halide particles. By the way, all the videos I show are real-time videos. Here you see silver halide particles responding to light being turned on and off. Uh, and here you see, uh, again, silver salt particles responding to a constant source of light and, and an oxidant. Uh, and you can see that uh, they show these emergent behavior that a single particle wouldn't show. These are about a micron in size, the particles themselves. So that's what we're trying to do. The uh, information in our case comes from a chemical or optical gradient, uh, and uh, the information processor uh, is a self-powered uh, object. So active matter, of course, you know are dynamic states far from equilibrium, uh, and nature has the best examples uh, of these. And what I show here are sort of side-by-side -side comparisons of some of the things that we have made uh, versus what you find out there. So this is bacteria. These are gold platinum rods that are two microns in size. They have about the same velocity as typical flagellar bacteria. Uh, here you see a more collective uh, behavior where uh, this particle is repelling uh, silica particles. And these synthetic motor systems allow us to control critical features of active matter, which are hard to control in living systems. Living systems are finicky, you have to feed them, they die on you, uh, and all kinds of problems, but we can do them in under much more controlled uh, environment. <clears throat> now, let me, before I get started, let me talk about the source of free energy. So you can always move charged particles by applying an electric field or magnetic particles by applying a magnetic field, but that's an ensemble behavior. What we are interested in is to endow individual particles with the ability to move on their own and make decisions on their own. Uh, and these are what we call motors, uh, and this, because they're too small to carry their own gas tanks, um, and they have to harvest the energy from the surrounding. And the way you do it in nature uh, is, of course, uh, by catalysis, uh, you turn uh, chemicals, substrates into products, uh, and you drive uh, the energy from that to do mechanical motion. And so you need catalysis and asymmetry because you want them to move in certain directions. <clears throat> so. Um, so given this is a nanoscale conference, well, the conference is not nanoscale, but it's about nanoscale. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, uh, motors that are nanometer scale. One of the things we found out early on is that enzymes, when they're catalyzing the substrate, and we're talking about free swimming enzymes, when they're catalyzing the substrate, they show enhanced diffusion. And here are just two examples of many that we have looked at. Uh, and what you see, uh, for example, in catalase, is as you increase the substrate concentration, the diffusion increases. And if you add uh, an inhibitor, you go back down to the base diffusion. So what that suggests is there's nothing special about motor proteins. All enzymes, I say all, we've only looked at a dozen, but all enzymes um, 
can generate enough power to cause their own movement. Now, what is the mechanism for this? And this is somewhat uncertain. Uh, we can estimate the force per turnover uh, using simulations. Uh, and it's about 10 piconewtons per turnover, which is about the same as motor proteins. Of course, these are not on tracks. These are free swimming. Uh, several mechanisms have been suggested. One, which involves uh, cyclic conformational changes that causes swimming. The other involves um, either a diffusiophoresis or an osmophoresis mechanism where you have an imbalance between the reactant and the product because on one face of the enzyme, you're converting reactants to products. Both of these mechanisms have problems with them, and so I'm not convinced that these are the answers. One of the restrictions here is, of course, you're working ultra low Reynolds number, and there are only so many things you can do to move things in these num region. Uh, but this is an important issue, and it informs on the mechanism of chemotaxis uh, and other things that I will talk about. Now, chemotaxis. This is the hallmark of living systems. Living systems move towards gradient of their food or fuel or whatever you want to call it. And up until we observed it, it had never been seen in synthetic uh, systems. And the question was, can single molecules chemotax? Uh, and the answer uh, is yes. And the way you, we do this is we send the substrate in a microchannel network, send the substrate through one channel, the enzyme through the other channel, and then you watch the transverse movement of enzyme across the channel towards the substrate. And we see that. Uh, and I believe that this is fundamental to the design of active matter because this is a new way of directing motion using chemical fuel. Uh, it promotes channeling and it leads to some understanding of how metabolomes are formed. So how do we know this? Uh, well, so here is an example again with catalase and hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and we are looking at the transverse movement of the enzyme. And what you see, the green and blue, one of them is active catalase but no substrate. And the other is inactive catalase plus substrate. Uh, you see these sort of overlap. The red is when you have both the active enzyme and the substrate, and you, you see a clear shift. Uh, same with ureas. You see a clear shift uh, from here to here. So clearly, the chemo tax. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the um, things to remember is I showed you that these enzymes show enhanced diffusion. Uh, when they turn over the substrate, so you might say, well, okay, so the chemotaxis is just an enhanced diffusion mechanism where it spreads preferentially towards the substrate side because that's the side where it's going to show enhanced diffusion, but at the end of the day, you're going to have an equilibrium distribution of enzymes. Um, <clears throat> and it turns out, interestingly, that is not the case. In fact, this can lead to non-equilibrium focusing of enzymes in certain areas. And one way to show this is this, where you have microchannel, where you have uniform concentration of enzymes. <coughs> and then you either pass the substrate through the middle or not. Uh, and when you have uniform concentration over time, you see this distribution. When you pass the substrate, the enzymes actively move in into the central channel. So you go from, go from a uniform to a non-uniform distribution of enzymes. Clearly, that uh, is not consistent with just simple enhanced diffusion. There is something else uh, going on here that we, we're trying to unravel. Um, metabolomes. So th thanks to metabolone formation, we all managed to live. Um, so in many of the um, metabolic pathways, um, we have enzyme cascades operating, so many, many enzymes. 
You start with the substrate and they keep handing over the product to the next enzyme for which it is the substrate. And here is just one example, a purine formation, uh, which is an essential um, for, for living systems. And when you have a system which lacks purine and you give it the initial substrate, you see these enzymes come together and form clusters. When they have made enough purine, they disperse. If you make them purine deficient, they come together again. Uh, and this is what's called metabolome formation. There's obvious advantage to it because if the enzymes are close to each other, one enzyme can hand over the substrate to the other one. Um, so the substrate doesn't go into solution in the bulk, so there's less wastage, uh, more specificity, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So there's an advantage to active site uh, co-localization. So the question is, what causes metabolome formation? And, and the uh, going hypothesis is that uh, you have non-covalent enzyme-enzyme interactions which brings the enzymes together. There's only one problem with it. Metabolomes have never been detected, enzyme-enzyme complexes. <clears throat> um, and so we decided to take a look at this, and the one that we decided to take a look at is the glycolysis uh, cascade, uh, which involves many, many enzymes, but let's look at the first four. So the first enzyme is hexokinase, which converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. Next enzyme converts it to fructose 6-phosphate. Next one converts it to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and then aldolase converts it to the next one. And the question is uh, whether these enzymes come together if you provide it with glucose only. The reason being hexokinase will make the substrate for the second, which should chemotax towards the hexokinase, which will make the substrate for the third, which is then chemotax, and so you should have sequential chemotaxes uh, going on. So we label these two with a dye, and we, using microchannel network, again, we started looking at them. Uh, first of all, hexokinase and aldolase both show enhanced diffusion when you have uh, substrate present, and again, it's a substrate enhanced uh, diffusion. Uh, so we have a microchannel, three-channel microchannel network. We can vary the length and therefore the residence time uh, inside uh, the microchannel. And so the first set of experiment involved hexokinase, and we have either buffer or D-glucose here, and buffer D, L, or mannose here. The difference between, so L-glucose is not a substrate. It's got the wrong isomer. Mannose binds more strongly than D-glucose to hexokinase, but turns over more slowly. <clears throat> and what you see, um, and it's a little hard to see here, um, so the, basically what these are showing is central channel is the enzyme and what you have in the flanking channels. And let me just focus here. The black and blue are either buffer or L glucose, and you don't see a shift. Uh, green is mannose, so you see a slight shift. Red is D glucose, which is the natural substrate, and you see the maximum shift. And so it clearly zeroes in on its own substrate and chemotaxis. Uh, same with aldolase. If you put aldolase in the middle and the rest of the enzyme plus glucose in one of the channels, you see aldolase preferentially move towards this and not move towards buffer. And the longer you run the experiment, bigger is the shift towards uh, this channel. And you can see this. Uh, this is at 8.6 seconds. This is at 17.3 seconds. This is a pretty, fairly short experiment. The next question is, are these movements sequential? Because if you start with glucose, that's the immediate sub substrate for hexokinase. And so that should move in first. And then eventually you'd make the product, that's the substrate for aldolase. So there should be a time delay before aldolase starts moving in. <coughs> and so to show this, 
Uh, we put the substrate in the middle, hexokinase and the second enzyme here, third enzyme and aldolase here, and we should see a timed movement into the central channel, which you do. The hexokinase first moves in, and then after a time, um, the aldolase moves in. <coughs> Uh, and there's a significant move, and this is enzyme concentration, percent of the enzyme that's moving into the central channel. So clearly, uh, this shows that in fact, you can have metabolome formation through chemotaxis. Uh, just to make sure that this also happens in cellular environments where you have crowding. Uh, uh, we uh, repeated the experiment using FICOL, which induces uh, the crowded environment typically found in the cell, you see the same sequential movement. The uh, migration is about half a micron per second, which interestingly is very similar to what has been reported for enzymes diffusing in living cells. And so what that means is that <coughs> metabolic formation is triggered by the initial substrate. It has nothing to do with the formation of enzyme-enzyme complexes. And the initial substrate triggers the formation of these metabolon uh, complexes. There is a practical side to all of this, which is this allows you to separate catalytically active molecules which might be identical in size and identical in charge because if you send these molecules through one channel and the substrate through the other, uh, the only the most active catalysts will migrate across and come out of this, less active ones will move over to the other channel. So we've tried this and it works. Uh, we use this two channel and five channel outlet um, architecture, it's low flow speed, uh, and we use one to one mixture of enzymes and you see a decent separation. Uh, this is what COMSOL predicts. This is what we see. And notice active and inactive catalase. They're inactive by cyanide. They're identical in size, identical in charge. You can see separation. Uh, if you want to do a real good job of it, you need a better architecture. The point is you can separate active from inactive catalysts. They could be enzymes. They could be other kinds of catalysts, even though they are identical in size and charge, there's no labeling involved, uh, and so on. <clears throat> now, when you take these enzymes and you anchor them on a surf substrate, then the mechanical force that they generate through, okay, there are two kinds of substrates, <laughs> depending on what field you come from. So I'll call them surface. When you anchor them on a surface, the mechanical force that they generate from substrate turnover gets transferred to the fluid. And now they become pumps. There are no moving parts to it, but they can pump fluid. And the system is very simple. Just have a surface, in this case gold. You put in the enzymes. Uh, you throw in some particles so you can trace the fluid flow using these trace of particles, uh, and then you watch. And so here's an example, uh, in this case catalase, where you see pumping towards uh, the gold surface. I should point out that depending on the enzyme, they either pump inward or they pump outward at the surface. And because it's a closed chamber, because of fluid continuity, if you look higher up, it pumps in the opposite direction. So you're having convective loops in these cases. So uh, you see catalase, you see glucose oxidase. I guess these are harder to see. And again, just like the diffusion of the enzyme, these pumps, the pumping velocity depends on the substrate concentration. You see this for catalase, you see this for glucose oxidase, lipase, urease, um, we've seen it for DNA polymerase, uh, and so on. <clears throat> so you see these, uh, this pumping behavior. Now, of course, um, uh, eventually they run out of substrate and they stop pumping. These are basically sensors come pumps because they only pump when they see a specific substrate. It could be the 
the um, <coughs> cofactor, or it can be the substrate. Uh, so when they run out of substrate, for example, you can add fresh substrate and you can recover uh, the pumping uh, velocity. Now, as I said, these pumps, they either pump inward or outward. Most pumps pump inward. Uh, urease is an example of one that pumps outward at the surface. Uh, you can hope, make uh, enzyme cascades. In this case, it's a catalase pump, but you do not supply it with hydrogen peroxide. Instead, you supply it with glucose oxidase and glucose, which makes hydrogen peroxide. So it's now coupled to another enzyme system, and it, so it acts as a sensor for these also. Um, uh, so the mechanism, um, the dominant mechanism seems to be the exothermicity uh, of the reaction, which of course would cause the uh, fluid to rise on top of the pattern, and which means it'll pump inwards. Um, when the products are denser than the substrate, urease is a good example. Urea to ammonium and bicarbonate uh, causes higher density. You pump the other way. And the way you can figure this out is by, instead of taking a pump like this, make it vertical, and look at whether it pumps up or down. And for the ones that are driven by exothermicity, you see pumping upwards. For urease, it's pumped downwards. You can also invert the pump, in which case the flow is reversed because the density gradient is reversed. Um, and there's nothing funny about it. The flow is reversed, but the velocity doesn't change. Um, the tracers have no effect. You can change the uh, charge on the tracers, and, and that doesn't cause any difference in pumping velocity. Uh, so what really it depends on is the exothermicity of the reaction, uh, the size of the pump. Interestingly, it depends on the height of the chamber. Uh, and the prediction is that it should roughly go up as, as a cube of the height of the chamber. And that's what we see. When you double the height of the spacer, the uh, pumping velocity goes up seven times. Two cubed is eight, so it's close enough. <coughs> Uh, and you can hook up these pumps, I don't have the time to talk about it, uh, to make networks um, and so on, so on, so forth. <clears throat> uh, you can use them to release things um, because basically they are monitoring the substrate concentration around them and pumping velocity depends on it. We have uh, money from DITRA who is interested in neutralizing toxins. And so in this case, we attached um, the enzyme acid phosphatase, which hydrolyzes organophosphate bond, which is the key to nerve agents, onto a gel which we fill with a drug. Uh, and then uh, when we add a organophosphate in the surrounding, it starts pumping and releasing the drug. Uh, it's not a perfect pump because you see some leaching even without the substrate present. But as you add more substrate, you have faster pumping. So you can actually uh, control the release of the substrate. So it's A, it's neutralizing the nerve agent by hydrolyzing it. B, it's pulling it in. And C, it's releasing a drug at the same, same time. Uh, the other uh, nice thing about these pumps is you can there's this move towards making smaller and smaller sensors. The problem with small sensors is it takes a long time for your analyte molecule to diffuse to the sensor. Uh, and especially if the analyte molecules are large. This is a log plot uh, where we said, how long does it take for 100 molecules to diffuse to the sensor? Uh, and you see for large particles, it takes very long time. But if the sensor is located in the middle of the pump, then you can, uh, you can pump in the thing actively, and, and it cuts down on the time. So if you have a one micron particle, let's say a bacteria or something, um, normally they'll take a very long time to diffuse to the sensor. But if you have pumping going on, you can, you can uh, speed up the process 1,000 to 10,000 times. 
Um, so this is some other practical application of the pumps. So single enzyme molecules generate sufficient mechanical force to substrate turnover to cause their own movement. This movement becomes directional in the presence of a gradient. They can act as pumps, control flow rate, and there's sufficient force for the stochastic motion of cytoplasm and organization of metabolomes and signaling complexes and convective transfer in fluid. There are several papers recently which show these things. So I think uh, this is, appears to be a new area of mechanobiology, intrinsic force generation by non-ATP dependent uh, enzymes. Now, let's go smaller. These enzymes are over 10 nanometers. Um, we chemists have been working on sub-nano forever. Um, when for some reason, nano has stuck, but sub-nano pico hasn't. So uh, this is a catalyst, which is six angstroms um, in diameter, and it catalyzes this reaction. And the question is, just like enzymes, do we see enhanced diffusion uh, if we add substrate? And the answer is yes. So if you add the substrate, the diffusion goes up. If you add an inhibitor, it goes back down uh, to the base value. So um, this is nothing peculiar to enzymes. Furthermore, um, we did DFT calculation to make sure that it's not the change in size which is causing this enhancement in diffusion. And the change in size is about 10%. We see a much bigger change in diffusion, so it's not simply the change in size. May I also add that these are th pretty close to thermoneutral reactions. So it's not even exothermicity that's driving these. Now, um, one of the interesting things is when bacteria or algae are active, they have a profound influence on in the fluid around them. For example, they enhance the diffusion of tracer particles in the fluid. This has been known for some time. Um, we discovered, these were our first motors that we ever made, these gold platinum rods, which move because of um, redox catalysis of hydrogen peroxide. And uh, my colleague, Tom Malouk, wanted to see whether they have the same effect on surrounding tracer particles. Um, and in fact, the parallel is very uh, striking. This is, this is bacteria, sorry, these are rods and these are bacteria. And the tracer diffusivity is plotted against active flux, uh, which is defined as the number of active particles times their velocity. And you see the same kind of relationship, the same kind of physics, even though the propulsion mechanism is very, very different. So our question then was, okay, so these are micron-sized things. What happens if you go all the way down to angstroms? Do you see the same kind of momentum transfer? Um, and so this react, back to this reaction again, we started using these as tracers. So these are really, really small. And we're talking one angstrom, two angstrom tracers. And the answer is yes. So here is catalyst diffusion versus turnover rate. And you see nice linear correlation. And this is the diffusion of tetramethyl silane versus turnover rate, same kind of linear diffusion. By the way, the enzyme diffusions we measure by fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, by tagging the enzymes. Here, we can't tag the organometallic catalyst because the dye would be bigger than the catalyst. So these are done by NMR diffusion experiments. So this is a totally different technique, but it gives you very similar answers. <clears throat> uh, and then, um, if you plot these against active flux, and in this case we define active flux as the number of catalyst molecules times their ballistic velocity, which we back out from the increased diffusion uh, re being related to the ballistic velocity, which is discussed in this paper, you see um, straight lines. 
um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and then the question is, how does this relate to this micron size bacteria or gold platinum rods? Um, and the way you can depict this is this is the effective diffusivity, which is the base diffusivity, which is Brownian diffusion times the active flux times the fudge factor, beta. And beta has the dimension of length to the power four, so you can plot beta to the one quarter versus the length of the swimmer, you get a nice straight line all the way from microns to angstrom size. And something that we don't understand, nor do the authors of these papers do, is that the beta and the length of the swimmer seem to be similar. The value of beta. Maybe it, it suggests something about interaction lengths. And this is true up here. It looks very close to zero because it's angstrom, and so in this scale, it's close to zero. <clears throat> so uh, and that's, that's the story here. Um, we see the same thing with, the, with enzymes. I won't um, spend too much time on it. Uh, and so we've been, while we've been looking at the fundamentals, we've also been looking at some practical applications. For example, we have um, looked at um, recruiting particles um, to uh, cracks in bones, for example. When you crack a bone, uh, you leach out ions, which causes ion gradients, and, and that causes these particles to come in, uh, and they can, they can deliver bone growth factors. Similar ion gradients have been used. I'm almost done. Similar ion gradients have been used to uh, <coughs> enhance oil recovery uh, in oil fields. Um, desalinization of membranes. Um, we can use them to release insulin in response to glucose in the ambient. These are the enzyme pumps. So there are a number of applications that are coming in, uh, but, but there are a lot of unsettled fundamental questions, as you no doubt saw from this. Um, Part of it has the fact that it, these are low Reynolds number issues. Part of it has to do with non-equilibrium physics, um, and so on. <clears throat> so these are the people who have worked on the problem, and collaborators, Tom Malouk in particular, has been very helpful in many of our uh, experiments. Um, some of the other people, uh, some of our involved in experiments, other in modeling, Vin Crespi in physics, and, and uh, Dal Veligon, chemical engineer, has done a lot of modeling. Interestingly, the physics and the chemical engineers come give me opposite results. So we just pick the one that suits us. <laughs> uh, these are the people. These are the people who uh, have funded uh, our work. Uh, so this is kind of our dream. Um, why Audi magazine published it, I don't know. Uh, that's our dream. And this is where we are. Thank you. <laughs>